So again, it's important to recognize how our biases affect our view of history. But what really matters? It's important that we understand and learn about history and what others have uh, what others have done before us. How what revivals and have occurred and transformed and shaped church history. It helps develop our own understanding of our own faith uh, and enrich our own faith. Uh, but it's not enough just to know about it. Uh, you know, um, this, these ideas, these concepts, they need to go from our head to our heart. Uh, I'll give you an example, uh, and this is from history itself. It's the story of a young Russian Christian in the early part of the 20th century, or the latter part of the 19th century, actually, who, as a young boy, um, uh, was, in a, was in a church, and uh, was asked by his his uh, pastor or priest to uh, to memorize scripture. He was encouraged to do it, and every time he uh, memorized a piece of scripture, his pastor or his priest would give him a piece of candy. Well, he really liked candy, and as a matter of fact, he um, um, he uh, it really motivated him uh, over over a period of a significant period of time. He actually. Uh, managed to memorize the entire New Testament. He also developed a little bit of a weight problem because of that, um, because he got he ate so much candy as a result of memorizing the New Testament. Um, but you would expect somebody that had memorized the entire New Testament to be a leading Christian in the world uh, in the 20th century. But you know, the, the one thing I remember um, this person for uh, in uh, in the early 1960s, uh, at the height of the Cold War, he um, he took off his shoe in the United Nations building, banged it against the side of its desk, and uh, and declared to the United States uh, that we will bury you. Um, he almost in initiated World War III and a nuclear holocaust, <laughs> but fortunately, calmer heads prevailed. His name was Nikita Khrushchev, and he was the Soviet premier and a, and a devout atheist at that time in his life. At some point, um, his knowledge of Scripture never went from his uh, his head to his heart, and uh, and so later in his teenage years or early in his uh, 20s, he started pursuing uh, communism and uh, disavowing his own faith uh, in Christ. Let's talk about Christianity in the first century. So in the very beginning of, of early church history, after the church began to grow in Acts chapter 2, we see some exciting things take place, but then all of a sudden we see some trouble some perse persecution that takes place, the inquisition of Peter and John, the arrest and miraculous release of the apostles, and finally the martyrdom of Stephen in Acts chapter 7. Some disturbing things begin to happen, but ironically and interestingly enough, what we see immediately after that is we see, we see the church spread as a result of persecution. The, the disciples were scattered, throughout the Middle East and Europe and into Africa because of persecution. And um, generally speaking, uh, historically, the church has fared very well in the face of persecution. The question is, have, have you or I personally faced uh, persecution as a Christian? Um, you know, and there's different levels of persecution, everything from government uh, restrictions to life threatening torture or martyrdom. Currently, um, there were more Christians martyred for their faith in the 20th century than in the previous 19 centuries combined. A total of 26 million Christian documented martyrs and 200 million Christians are today are denied basic human rights every day because of their faith. That's disturbing. Um, you know, I have a personal friend of mine. Uh, here's a picture of him. He was one of my students. His name is Kenneth Bai. He was one of my students when I was a campus pastor at the University of Oregon. And, um, and he uh, decided to, uh, to go into missions work and tourism in, in Korea and China. And occasionally he would take tour groups into North Korea from China and South Korea, uh, many of them to visit relatives, 
But while he was there, he would care for orphans and do other Christian charitable work. Uh, well, he was arrested by the North Koreans and, and sent to a work prison for two to three years. He Fortunately, he was recently released. Uh, he suffered for his faith tremendously. Um, he was certainly someone that I prayed for, prayed for uh, every day for years to be released from prison. But there are millions more like Kenneth Bay today uh, suffering for their faith in Jesus Christ. Um, so anyway, in the early churches, as persecution uh, increased, uh, we see an expansion of the gospel from uh, Jerusalem, where the early Christians were all gathered, to Judea, uh, to Philip going to Samaria, to Philip reaching Simon the sorcerer, to Philip reaching an Ethiopian Christian. And then later we see Saul's conversion in Acts chapter 9 in the midst of him persecuting other Christians. Um, we also see a theological expansion that occurs in the early church when Peter has a vision in Acts chapter 10 that helps expand Christianity beyond the Jewish community to Gentiles. And, um, and he, he suddenly, suddenly realizes that God accepts men from every nation who fear him. And uh, this was an important expansion in the early church, but because without it, Christianity would have remained a small uh, a small Jewish sect, and instead it become it became a global phenomenon over the next, uh, just even in the next uh, generation or two. Um, so how, how do these events expand the influence of Christianity? By the end of the first century, um, uh, Christianity had reached the entire Roman Empire and even had started creeping beyond it. But it's estimated that perhaps as much as 5% of the population of the empire had converted to Christianity. You know, uh, I don't have time to go over both of these examples, but uh, there's some great, two great examples of modern stories of Christian expansion in the face of severe persecution. One occurred in China, probably one of the most famous ones. And what happened there was during the cultural revelation, the cultural revolution of the 1960s under, under Mao Zedong, the, the um, Chinese uh, premier, um, Christians were severely persecuted, thrown in jail. All of the Christian leaders were thrown in jail. Um, they estimate that uh, three or 400,000 Christian leaders were thrown in jail. Well, finally, towards the uh, end of the 60s, because of political pressure, um, the Chinese government finally decided uh, they needed to do something about all of these prisoners. So they decided what they would do uh, was they would release them, but they would they would uh, release them throughout the entire uh, country of China. They wouldn't release them back to their to their friends, to the people they were familiar with. They figured if they if they remove them as far away from their own cultures as possible, from their friends and their family, uh, that Christianity would quickly die out. Well, um, at just the at just the opposite happened. As a matter of fact, they went throughout China, began to establish house churches, and uh, and thus the house church movement in China started uh, because um, three or four hundred thousand uh, um, tested, tried, and true Christians uh, re were released from prison and started house churches throughout China. And it's estimated that uh, within the, the next decade, Christianity grew from from uh, from a few hundred thousand Christians in China at that time, um, certainly less than a million to uh, 50, 60, or 70 million Christians. Now it's estimated there's over 150 million Christians in China. Um, but anyway it's, anyway, it's a great story of how under intense persecution, in spite of intense persecution, uh, the gospel continues to spread. Um, in early Christianity, we not only see persecution, but we see uh, the vital role of the Holy Spirit and the charismatic nature of early Christianity. Um, the uh, Holy Spirit directed these believers. They were used supernaturally. They were regularly and frequently used in various forms of charismatic gifts. And uh, most of these forms of charismatic expression were seen in some segments of Jewish religion, but not to the not as widespread and not to the degree that we saw in the early church. Looks like we're going to have to have one more segment for this section to, to finish up. Look forward to talking to you one more time on the other side.